Good evening. I want to welcome everyone here to the Vocational Technical High School School Committee meeting on November 11th. So can we stand, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there any public comment this evening? Not. Ms. Moscovich. Two, two of my kids are on their way. Okay. Do you want to talk about something else, just so? <laughs> and then come to them? Or do you want us to stick into it? Let's, we can skip it for a couple yeah. more. All right. Oh, they're here. Oh, they're here. Okay. I thought about SkillsUSA was about being on time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 to be fair, to the parking lot is full. The parking lot is full. There's so much activity here tonight. Really, yeah. So, so just... Just one more. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they, they're probably running from the lower lot. <laughs> Just for a couple of minutes. Um, okay. While well, we have a couple of minutes, I'd like to introduce two new school committee members this evening. Patty Lowell, uh, who's from Amesbury. Yay. And Don Holiday is our new representative from New Report. Yay. Yay. Got a full house on it. I suppose Jim. Yes. Move the minutes of September 13th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Present. Abstain. <laughs> We're abstaining. <laughs> Treasurer's report. Move to accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Any comments? Okay. Welcome again, Ms. Hello. Moskovich. Hi, I'm, I'm Jane Muscovich. I am the Skills USA advisor. I'm also um, one of three. I'm also a health, a health assisting instructor, and um, tonight we were invited to come. I don't dress in red because I don't want to outshine them. I do have my blazer, too. I was asked that when I walked in. Um, this past June, we traveled with 17 people to Atlanta, Georgia, after qualifying for the um, SkillsUSA National Leadership and Skills Conference, um, representing the state of Massachusetts. I'm going to actually have um, the students, these are the gold medal winners that have not yet graduated. Two of our students graduated, um, Emily Hussein, who was from Haverhill, and Royale Almonte, who's also from Haverhill. So I will let them come and introduce themselves, tell you what town they're from, city they're from, and what they won their gold medal in. Hello, I'm Nathaniel Shramko. I'm from Groveland. I'm in the shop of, or I'm a senior in electronics and robotics, and I won a gold medal in the competition of electronics technology. Hello, I'm Owen Brannelly. I'm from Amesbury. Uh, I'm a senior in the business tech and marketing shop, and me and my group, we won a gold medal in business technology and management career pathway showcase. Hello, my name is Catherine Rocco. Uh, I am from Georgetown. I am currently a senior in the shop of business tech and marketing, and along with two of my fellow cla uh, classmates, we placed first in career pathways at the Skills USA National Championships. Hello, my name is Gabriela Ortiz. Um, I'm from Haverhill. I'm a senior in business and marketing, and I also was competing in the Career Pathways Showcase Business and Marketing, and we won first place. And what did you come? What was the presentation? Oh, it was on um, T 
teaching students um, and kids our age about financial literacy and you know the awareness of knowing how to save money and you know things that they don't really know that they should know so yeah Great. Thanks. hello everybody I'm Ken Roberts I live in Amesbury and I'm a senior in the shop of design and visual communications and as Miss M mentioned my my teammates have my fellow teammates have graduated already but we won a gold medal nationally in the competition of arts and communications uh, career pathway showcase and what we did is we created a skills USA board game essentially to show other students and uh, help them learn the different employability skills and the skills USA framework in an easy and more tangible way. So if I can just chime in a little bit, um, I was lucky enough to accompany these students uh, to Atlanta. Um, it was, we had such a great adventure. It was a wonderful time. The, it's the coolest thing to see our school and your students at a big, um, what do you want to call it? A big conference center um, with, with your school's name on it and our kids winning gold medal. It was, it was pretty fabulous. And, and Nate, he really he, um, he really had to stick it through. We, we, they lost his his equipment for the competition. I actually came a day or two later, so I brought another whole thing of um, equipment for the competition. It too got lost, um, but I put an air tag in it, so I was able to track it down, um, and we were able to get it back to him just in enough time for him to be able to complete compete that day. Um, but it really, it was a wonderful experience, I think, for the <coughs> students. They all wrote me thank you notes. Thanks, guys. Um, but it was just a really wonderful time with, with our kids and, and to see them do so well. Neat. Something else happened to you this week. You want to share with everybody what happened? National Merit. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I forget the official name for what I was received, but it was the National Merit, National Merit Honor Scholarship commendation for a uh, very high score on the PSAT exam. I believe it was top 50,000 in the nation. So lots of great things happening at these students and I know um, they've got plans for this year that are really exciting and um, you know keep up the good work. You're, you're really you know doing a wonderful job shining for Whittier Tech so keep it up. Ms. Lynch, have we ever had a commended student? I remember. Yeah, not, I don't remember, I don't remember in my remember. 16 years, so Nate's doing really well. Yes, Jen said, have no, we ever? I don't think so. It's a That's a huge, that's a huge deal. This is a national thing, so. Yeah. So two and three. Terrific. Oh, this is huge. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, our student representative, Dewinsky Gustav. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Lynch, and all members of the student board. <laughs> all right, for the student government, they are very busy and working on the pep rally plans. They have some fun events for students to participate in on October 19 at 1 p.m. That's when the pep rally will be held. Uh, they are holding a spirit week from October 16 to 20th. The students will be encouraged to dress up in costumes according to the theme of the day. Finally, on October 20th, we will hold our second annual homecoming dance in the gym. They are very excited, and it will be as well attended as last year. The Drama Club is currently auditioning students for a fall coffee house talent show on November 7th in the auditorium. All are welcome, and the event is free. There is also a spring musical, Mean Girls, and the students are extremely excited about the show. The chess club is up and rolling, meeting every week. They lost several seniors last year, but this year they have many new players from all grades. They will be starting their first tournaments in a few weeks. The poetry club has <coughs> not had any attendees as of yet, but they're going to drum up some interest ASAP and kick it off with a fall spooky theme. The multicultural club enjoy meeting new members and welcoming past members in September. 
They have two presentations planned for the month of October where students will share about their personal cultural journeys. In addition, they're kicking off a new activity sponsored by the club, First Chapter Thursdays, where students will read the first chapter of a book in another language or from different culture other than their own. We're, they are also looking, I'm sorry, they are also sponsoring a book where interested members can share about their choice reading books. For the Interact Club, they help set up team Averill River <clears throat> At the Hiver River Ruckus, they have a fundraiser going for a Patriots fan basket now through the end of October. On Thursday, November 9th, a couple of club members will be volunteering at the annual Rot Rotary Veterans Breakfast. Um, they were ushering the vesters. Ushering the vesters seats. One student will also be singing the national anthem from our school. The ski club is in the process of planning their trip as well as a raffle. And the yearbook, their cover design is awaiting administrative approval and should go to press within the next week. Students are all capturing images from the previous 49 yearbooks for use as background imagery in this year's yearbook and celebration of the 50 years. And um, we have had a they have had their kickoff meeting with Jocelyn's yearbook representative. Fall sports photography is underway and being covered by several seniors. The boys and girls cross country team continued with the miles and each week. Their top girl remains undefeated in the league. With the girls team coming off with a win at Shaw Scene. Their top boy just came off with the top 10 finish and the Frank Kelly Invitational and ran them. Football is having a great year with their current record of 4-1. to one. The team has had a great game last week, knocking off the top the ranked team in their league, Neshoba. This week's Manchester Essex is coming to Whittier on Thursday this week. That's it. Thank you. We're going to ask the architects to come forward and present Good evening. Thank you. Uh, David Sandin, uh, left field, owner's project manager. Uh, before we get into the presentation tonight, we're actually going to show a video. My name is Maureen Lynch. I'm the superintendent of Whittier Regional Vocational Technical High School. We have a lot of pride in our building. We've done a lot of work. We have a fabulous maintenance department that really does a phenomenal job making our school look nice and clean, but we have some significant issues behind our walls. Some days are absolutely crazy. You don't know what's gonna break. Things break. They break a lot around here. It's really our systems, our plumbing, our electrical, our wastewater treatment. Those kinds of things are in serious need of an upgrade. The electrical substations are old. If one of those fail, then you have sections of the school that won't have power. The wastewater treatment plant, it is tired. It is due for an upgrade. And if that breaks, there's gonna be a panic because it's 50 years old. You just don't know what's gonna happen with the pipes underground. I would say I'm up almost every night thinking about what could possibly happen here at Whittier Tech. Not having a sprinkler system in here, things not being ADA compliant around here, that makes me nervous. Ventilation isn't that great in the building. I actually have no ventilation really whatsoever. Mist comes up in the air and if without proper ventilation it just kind of hangs out in the shop. This shop that we're in, it's not set up to be a plumbing shop, so we don't have like gas in all the locations that we need gas. We don't have water where we need water. There's not a lot of lighting, so oftentimes like we're sitting in like a dark classroom. Some of the classrooms don't have windows at all, so it's just like concrete walls. Every day there is something that is failing in our building that we are trying to fix and work through. We had an issue with water coming into the building. Two days before that, we lost electricity for three days. We have some issues with our heat. We have issues with our air conditioning. Air handlers, Univent heaters, they're from the 1970s, most of the equipment. I walk around and it still blows my mind that they still have things and equipment here when I was here in 89, when I was a kid. 
I really dread when it gets either too hot or too cold because the building can't manage that. We had to send kids home last week because it was too warm in the building. On the fourth floor, it got up to over 95 degrees. That's not an environment that students can learn in or teachers can teach in. I think the school is definitely outdated. The shops are small. They definitely need to be larger. We can't get the equipment that we would really like to get in here or need to get in here to teach all the stuff that's up and coming. It's not really made to be modern, you know. We can't upgrade, we can't move machinery around. We, we're very limited to what we could do here. So as the trade advances, we're kind of stuck. When we looked at it through the feasibility study, overwhelmingly the numbers are clear that financially and fiscally the best thing for us to do for our region is to move forward with a new building. A new school, it would benefit us, it would benefit the communities, it would benefit the students. The horizons are broadening and so I think that Whittier needs to be able to grow for the new students that are coming in so they can have the positive learning experiences that I had but in a maybe better environment. We're lucky to have some of our trade areas that are able to do work for us, but we are truly at our limit. We really need to do something, and we need to do something quickly and seriously. Okay. Well, thank you for having us tonight. Um, we have a 60-slide deck presentation, but Probably half of the slides will be extremely quick slides because uh, we know we have you have quite the agenda other than us. So the composition of the Whittier Tech School Building Committee um, it's made up of 16 members. Uh, it falls under the composition of the Building Committee. Uh, it does fall under the governance of the MSBA. The MSBA has certain procedures in place. Um, uh, where uh, a, just a certain roles have to fulfill the, again, the composition of the building committee. I'm going to apologize. This presentation is going to be very repetitive to a few of you since you obviously are part of the building committee. So the project team, again, um, David Sandin, I represent Left Field, your owner's project manager. We have a few members from JCJ here today, Emily Zarnecki. And then Doug Roberts and Jim LaPosta. And then from Consigli, we have Christy Lyons. So what do you tech timeline? Maureen, I assume you're going to take this. Sure. So um, the former superintendent in 2014 um, went through his own feasibility, he contracted out um, with another company and kind of walked through the building to kind of look at our needs. Um, and then since then, um, th we put in sta six statement of interest, and really Kara Cosmos was the, the ringleader behind that. She did the yeoman's work of that. Um, and we were finally accepted into, into eligibility in 2019, February before COVID um, of 2019. Um, and so we've been working since 2019 on this project, going through eligibility, through the feasibility, um, and we are just finishing up schematic design. The, the great thing about finishing schematic design is that now um, we have renderings. We can show people what it will look like. We, we have a cost figure to what it, the probable cost would be for, for the new building. Before any of that, we really didn't have that information. So it was really hard to share probable costs with, with our, our constituents. So at this point, we have shared probable costs with our constituents um, since schematic design is just about finished. Um, so again, you know, Whittier Tech, 50 years, we're, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary um, this Friday night um, with our um, Hall of Fame um, dinner along with a 50th year anniversary. Um, and, you know, we are providing the workforce for this area. You know, it's something I think people really need to understand that some of our communities, um, people can't afford to live in them because they're on the more affluent side, but we are providing that workforce for that city or town. Um, and that's what we've been doing for 50 years. That is our charter, and we are committed to that. We do it day, night, and summers. Um, as many of you, when you come in here at night, on a Wednesday night, you see all of our night school students coming in. Um, we have about 400 um, electric, electric, electricians and journeyman plumbers um, coming through the building, as well as welding um, and other courses that we're providing here. And then in the summer, um, you know, in the past, we would do discovery program for middle school students. 
Um, we have changed that direction because of the need in the workforce in this region to career technical institutes that are funded by the state. Um, and I think we just received a grant for $750,000. 85? So I was close. $785,000 um, this summer to um, run those CTI programs again. So we're really excited. Um, and what happens with those programs is those students go right into the workforce. It's a two hour, uh, 200 hour program and they go right into the workforce. We had a car uh, career fair um, here over the summer that was full and most of the students received jobs. So um, it's a very successful program that we work with Mass Hire on. Thank you, Maureen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the MSBA process, the Mass Massachusetts School Building Authority. So this, it's made up of nine modules. As you can see, what's colored uh, or what's highlighted, uh, module one through four is essentially complete. As Maureen indicated, we are at the end of the road for schematic design. The schematic design submission will go to the MSBA on, uh, go to the MSBA on October 26th. Uh, we will have a project scope and budget uh, conference call with the MSBA sometime in the month of November. And we are slated to receive approval from the MSBA at their board meeting on December 13th. Uh, we will then um, have securing of the funding, which would be January 23rd, 2024. Uh, design will continue and then consigli, um, obviously based on the successful passage of the vote, uh, they will mobilize in the spring of 2025 and the building will be complete and occupied for fall of 2028. And then there's about one year for parking lots, fields, site restoration, et cetera. So for options studied, Doug Roberts will walk us through a few slides. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, as David mentioned, MSBA is your funding partner. And for equity, for all of the projects that are going through their pipeline, they want to have a very prescriptive process. As Maureen indicated, we are completing schematic design at the end of the month but we had a path to get there. The path included three specific deliverables as part of this phase. First is preliminary design program. That's where we right size the school for your program. Uh, as you note on the slide there, MSBA had authorized this project to consider two grade en enrollment configurations, 1,280 students, which is uh, equals what you have today, or expanding your program to 1,400 students. After looking at the preliminary information, probable cost, uh, evaluating the different criteria for the two schemes, the school building committee decided to stick with the 1,280 student enrollment to one, control costs, and two, minimize the impact to your 11 uh, community uh, partners. Once we were authorized to move forward from preliminary design program, we moved into preferred schematic report. So what we do there, we go from general, really high level concepts to more detailed concepts. So we explored the three required options that MSB requires us to look at. One is a code upgrade of your existing facility. The other is an ad reno to your facility. And then we also evaluated two new construction options for this site. Again, um, the school building committee evaluated the, uh, the different options and selected uh, one option, new construction, 1280. Again, looking at a, a, coast, a host of criteria that look at community access, uh, educational appropriateness for the solution, site building costs, um, as well as schedule, the determination was the best option moving forward was a new solution, a new construction solution. Uh, David indicated that the basis of the schematic design will be used for the project funding, scope and funding agreement uh, that will go to vote in January. The uh, addition to our team in schematic design that also was the addition of Consigli, our construction uh, manager partner. Uh, they were able to provide the filter constructability reviews, uh, site logistic reviews, as well as uh, participate with our estimator in developing uh, comparable cost estimates, which reconciled to 1% of each other. So we're very confident with the numbers that were being brought forward to establish the cost of the project and the potential impact of the uh, 11 member communities. This is a list of criteria, uh, five major categories, 23 subcategories, Reader's Digest version. Each had a score. Each member of the building committee scored the different options. Oops, you took that slide out, sorry. So as I mentioned, the uh, new construction known as option A 3.1 
was advanced to schematic design, and that's what Jim and Emily will be presenting later in the presentation. Sorry, Doug. I was trying to slim down the slide deck. That's okay. <laughs> so how was the decision made to build a new school? As you heard from Doug Roberts, um, the committee carefully analyzed all the different options um, uh, from code to renovation addition, as well as two new uh, options. And again, it was qualitative uh, and also quantitative from a financial standpoint. And again, the most um, optimal, most cost, of, uh, cost effective, educationally appropriate, and most importantly, um, we'll say um, l the least disruptive to the students. What is unique with Whittier Tech is Whittier Tech does not have another location where they can send the shops, the programs, the students. I mean, this site, this is it. Um, a lot of other school districts, you somewhat can play hopscotch and move students and staff around. With the Whittier Tech, you can't do that. So um, that's how we landed on the decision to build a new school. So why does Whittier need a new building? Well, as you heard, um, it's 50 years old. Uh, it has reached its useful life. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's done an amazing job with cost maintenance. You will hear later on um, in the slide deck that uh, the MSBA has an incentive point and it's from zero to two, you can get additional incentive points. I carried throughout the length of the project 1.5. Um, I was on a call with MSBA yesterday and that 1.5, they gave us the final number, it's 1.65. So I've been doing this since 2005 and 1.65 for a maintenance incentive point is probably one of the highest I have seen to date. So um, kudos uh, on the maintenance of Whittier Tech. But, um, the uh, technical education has changed dramatically, uh, as you heard from when the school opened in 73 and then Bob Harding um, graduating in 89. Uh, I attended a uh, Vogue Tech school, not Whittier Tech, but a different one in 89 as well, and uh, it is much different than what a uh, vocational technical school looks like today. And Jim LaPosta will walk us through the design. So we'll see what... Uh technical high school looks like today over the next uh, few slides. So uh, which one of these do I use, David? That one? Okay. So let's start very high level. We'll talk about the um, what, what we have here. You heard the enrollment's 1,280 students. <coughs> what does that mean in terms of the size of the building? Your current building that we're in right now is 356,000 square feet. In order to accommodate the program for the same number of students to today's standards, both the MSBA standards, but what you really need to deliver uh, education in the 21st century and looking forward 50 years this will be another 50 year investment for the communities we need about 309 almost 391,000 square feet so this space gets bigger um, and obviously more complex and, and adaptable over time um, all of the drawings I'm going to share are, are from these boards so we'll go through these pretty high level we can obviously answer questions but you have uh, much more detail if you go up and look at the boards uh, carefully this is a, a map of the site, the site plan. Um, the existing stadium in the middle is the stadium, so that's staying. Your investment there is being respected and left in place, so that will that'll help, help hopefully orient you to these drawings. The plan is to build the new, high, the new school across the field from where we are today, and then tear this school down, this building down, and recreate and create new ball fields in this location that would end up being terraced. The site looks big and you do have a lot of land, but when you look at the wetlands that you have on the drive-in, look at the topography that you have on this drawing to the lower right, to the left of the drawing, there aren't a lot of places you can actually build in, a, in an easy or cost-effective way. And that was one of the things we looked at, and that's how we landed on the site for the school building, which is on the kind of lower left of the, of the site. So the building gets phased, that, get, that gets built. The driveway stays where it is, the entry drive stays, gets rebuilt. We put a loop in, so there'll be a loop road, um, so that, for instance, you know, when buses come in, they have their own separate drop-off, which will be around the, the, as you look at it, the left side, around the back of the school. Parents will have a driveway to the front. And then down to the bottom is the parking area, which is exactly where it is now, just rebuilt. Um, it's not moving, but we're moving the building closer, so the walk will be a lot less um, to there, and it'll, it'll be visible from the front door 
and it won't be jammed up when the buses are here like it is now. And for major events like tonight's game, much better and easier access to, to all of the activities. So a much easier and better traffic flow on the site, a much safer traffic flow because we don't have a lot of crossing traffic. New facilities for the buses, a new, new uh, uh, sewage treatment plant, new utilities, really an entirely new site built in a, in a series of phases. New, you can see at the top you have soccer, baseball, softball, tennis courts, practice fields, all in a nice uh, arrangement of uh, where they're all together. There'll be new fields and with some parking kind of sprinkled around within them to help serve them for events. So it becomes a really um, uh, well-organized and, and thoughtful site. If we look at the building, this, is, uh, this building has been called the courtyard scheme. It's organized around two courtyards. This is the floor plan of the lowest level. It's a three-story building now. Uh, it'll be a three-story building. This is the lowest floor. So what you're looking at now is at ground level but on the right side of this drawing, that's actually buried into the hillside because of the topography. So if you think of a house with a walkout basement, this is a little bit like that. So that entire right side of this drawing is against the hillside, and that's service, kitchen, um, locker rooms, things that don't really need a whole lot of windows. The area in blue are all the public functions. So for big public events, you have the auditorium, the gymnasium, and then at the top of the drawing, something we're calling Whittier Way, which is a combination meeting space, cafeteria, crossroads for the school. Uh, it's a place where a lot of activity can happen. And where the little red arrow is, that would be drop off in the morning for anybody coming by car. If parents are dropping off or picking up, students can come directly in there. The red arrow below that is a courtyard, an outdoor landscaped courtyard that students coming from buses would come in. So everyone can enter into the same space. It also provides outdoor space, outdoor activity. So if you're having a a big event, um, skills competition, basketball game, uh, production, you've got a kind of pre-function space, outdoor space, the ability to really use the building in a lot of different ways instead of being as separated as it is now. If you move to the left on this drawing, everything in the, in the kind of salmon color are the, are the beginning of the shop areas. The very far left, that's the transportation cluster where we have uh, automotive, we have the marine tech area, all of, all of those shops and support areas are located there. Ground level access, outdoor space for lay down area, um, you know, paved space right outside there. The center courtyard is, is a, we're calling it the Votech courtyard. It's not landscaped, it's hard paved area with covered areas for storage of materials, moving equipment in and out. What surrounds that on the top and the right side is the construction trades cluster. So you have all your trades in those areas. Again, outdoor access for delivery of materials, masonry piles outside, building the house, all those things can happen there. The far right of that area, that's advanced manufacturing and, um, and fabrications, all of those. So all of that's on the ground floor. Things that need access and taller spaces are all on the ground floor. <clears throat> Directly at the top in the center, the blue space is the, um, is the media center. So it's right in the heart of the school, easily accessible to everybody at all times. If we go up to the second floor, on the far right, this is now the actual main entrance of the school. This is ground level. So that little red triangle, that's the front door. Uh, that's where visitors would come in. That's where you have a secure entry vestibule. Not too dissimilar from what you have here now, just uh, up, updated, upgraded, and, and working in, a, in a, a smoother way. So the purple areas are the main office areas to the right, uh, kind of to the left of the, of the area, uh, center area is the nurse counseling areas. So all of the administrative functions are next to each other by the front door and overlook what we're calling Whittier Way. So as you come in, you'll overlook this two-story space that becomes the school crossroads. Uh, the blue boxes are the upper, the upper part of the gym and the auditorium. The right-hand side, well, that's where we are now. That'll be the Poets Inn, um, all of the, the kind of customer-facing areas will have their own separate entry uh, from the parking area, so they can be accessed by the public, by the community. There'll be an area where you come into a lobby um, and you'll have access to all of the, all of the public facing um, customer access points in one area, so students can really run it like a, like a small, almost like a little mall, if you, if you will, with different, different shop fronts. And then all of their support spaces, kitchens, 
um, uh, classroom areas are in that same space. So this way, uh, people can continue to come in and out of the building, customers, without ever having to go into the school. You can keep them completely separate. If we go down to the second floor, this, this other wing, we have uh, Allied Health um, and also the Engineering and Architectural Programs. The blue is the, in the center is the upper area of the Media Center. It's a two-story space, so not only is it in the middle of the school horizontal, but as you walk by, you'll be able to look down in it. So a lot of opportunities for learning to be on display in this building so students can see what other students are doing. That's really one of the things we talk about when we talk about next generation learning or 21st century learning is seeing what kids are doing and having kids see what other kids are doing because that's a, that's a strong, strong learning methodology. And then the third floor, you see all the color changed, it's different um, because we don't have any shops up here. These are, these are all really the academic programs up on the upper level. Um, so you have the center bar that goes down are primarily laboratory spaces, so all your science labs are located together. Then you have a series of uh, general classroom spaces that can be assigned over, over time to really any academic program, but they're arranged in clusters so that each cluster, if you look at the far right in the center, there's a small student collaboration breakout space in the center. Below that is a teacher planning space, and then all the classrooms are organized around it. So we've taken a large school and broken it into, into smaller neighborhoods so that students and teachers can really help continue the, the great relationship that you have here now and the sense of community that the school is, has, has fostered despite the facility not really supporting that. Now you'll have a building that actually supports the culture. And there's um, three of those neighborhoods plus the science cluster. And then the very uh, up, upper right corner, that purpley blue area, uh, is the district office. So that's located directly going the main entry and up one floor and that's where the, where the district offices will be. Here's an aerial view that shows uh, kind of how it sits into the site. That's the, the obviously the stadium, the parking. You see the buses around the back and, the, and then the entry between the, uh, the track and the, the building. Uh, the building will be primarily a, a masonry building. It'll be red brick and some, uh, some uh, uh, kind of buff colored um, a concrete block with some metal panel. The idea is to kind of recall the industrial buildings of the area of Haverhill and all the surrounding communities of the, the kind of strong industrial heritage here, but in a modern interpretation. This is the, um, the, the drop-off for parents. You can now see where the far left, that's the main, main entry and office at the upper level, and then this takes you straight into the Whittier Way part of the school building with lots of daylight and lots of glass. The new building will be very bright and very daylit as opposed to many areas of, of this school. Uh, here's the Poets Inn entry, the public facing side, has lots of opportunity for signage, outdoor dining, <coughs> great visibility uh, from, from the street as you come in. Emily. Right. Thank you. All right, so we wanted to showcase a few um, really important spaces within the school and just highlight. Uh, especially some of those community spaces, places that not only students and staff and teachers are using, but that the community would come into um, in, for evening events, um, in, even in the summer. So this is an image of Whittier Way, um, looking uh, from the lower level. So that lower level entry, you're looking up towards that second floor area where the main entrance is. Uh, you see the uh, common stair here. This is really a community stair. This is meant to um, not only move people up and down, but a place for students to gather, a place that they can even dine. Um, it could be used for theater, poetry night, um, art shows, whatever you want. Uh, it's really a, a place for gathering, and that was the idea behind this space. It's a hub for, th for the school and for the community, and it brings everybody together. We're showcasing the colors of the school, the maroon and the gold, to show school pride. We're also um, utilizing that in the furnishings. Furnishings are not selected yet, but this is an idea of, of how that could work. And really highlighting important themes of the school, workforce of tomorrow, technology. So utilizing materials like metal ceiling panels um, that are perforated for, with sound, but look high tech. Um, a lot of nice um, LED lighting to really brighten up the space. This is a view from upstairs. So if you came up those stairs and we're looking over the, uh, the overlook, this is the view you would see out that lower level um, lobby area towards the field. Um, you could see the courtyard to your left. This is an opportunity for dining, for additional activities, pre-event space um, as it's connected to the gym and the auditorium. 
And you can see how we're utilizing um, seating even around that stair below. So using uh, the wood, that warm, rich wood to really you know, warm up the space as a bench area and a um, high top table area. Taking some of those same themes and moving along the second floor, we wanted to highlight the makerspace. This makerspace is part of the technology cluster and will be a shared space for the CAD and um, drafting department, the engineering lab, electronics, robotics. It's a place where students from all of those different um, programs can come and work on CNC machines and 3D printers. We have an operable glass wall that opens out to the corridor where there will be a robotics field. It's a two-story space that students can uh, run drones or um, you know, work on robots. We wanted to highlight this space again with the yellow tones, so carrying the school colors throughout their common language throughout the building, and utilizing some graphics on the wall to, again, you know, create put some interest and, and highlight those different programs. Um, going back down to the first floor, the marine tech, um, as Jim mentioned, we have first floor access, so you have the overhead doors that gives easy access for uh, the students and even patrons who are bringing their, their vessels, whether it's boats or for the auto tech program, um, to the shops. We have you know, a number of areas to highlight you know, um, Skills USA. We can introduce flags and, and things like that. And actually, let me go back for one second. I wanted to highlight something that I meant to mention. You can see the flags hanging from the ceiling. Um, the idea there is to introduce a flag from each district so that students can feel connected back to their hometown. And, and again, you know, highlight those, three, those 11 districts that are really important to the school. Uh, moving upstairs to health assisting, um, the Allied Health Program is obviously a very growing program and the health assisting space, we wanted to show it as a real world environment. Um, you have your hospital beds, but in including all of the, the technology that's needed so that students can really experience and you know how to, how to do nursing and health assisting with, um, with patients. Upstairs, as Jim mentioned about the neighborhood breakout areas where the classrooms surround, this is an area for pullout for students to um, socialize, work together in groups. We have writable walls, technology, all visible from the classrooms and the teacher planning area. And that's highlighted with the, the various colored floor, um, introducing the maroons in each of those areas. And again, highlighting some of the walls with, um, you know, it could be wordles, it could be inspirational quotes, but um, identifying each neighborhood in a slightly different way for wayfinding. And we also have skylights that are going to bring a lot of nice natural daylight into those corridor areas. And lastly, just highlighting one of the typical um, classrooms as well as related rooms. Again, introducing those same warm tones in a more muted way. Um, we'll look at furniture options, but a lot of various height furniture, um, standing height, sitting height, and um, introducing uh, writable walls in these areas as well so that there's a lot of opportunity for learning and um, small group and large group activity wherever you are in the building. Okay. This is the deja vu moment in the presentation because David presented this earlier. But again, it's worth repeating with the successful vote on January 23rd. Uh, MSBA will enter into an agreement with the district that will then authorize us to move forward with detailed construction documents uh, that will commence uh, immediately following that approval, uh, allowing Consigli to commence on the site in early 2025, as David indicated, three years of construction for building occupancy for fall of September 2028. And then there'll be a year of mobilization to demolish the existing building, complete the field improvements for a completed project by year 2030. Sustainability, uh, the district, MSBA, and JCJ, uh, our entire project team, are committed to delivering a sustainable solution to the district and for your uh, member communities. Um, we have been tracking sustainability items through the entire design process, beginning at our interview, surprisingly. We are looking at sensible solutions that are cost effective and will have return investments for the district. Uh, we are looking at high uh, performance building envelope, uh, closed loop geothermal heat pump system. Uh, the advantage there, uh, there might be a very initial high first cost, 
but the incentives that are available from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and Mass Save actually make it budget neutral. There's immediate return on investment for the uh, selection of that system. In addition, it also helps us uh, exceed the requirements for the Mass Stretch Energy Code um, uh, to 40 percent, um, as well as the building will be set up with the infrastructure to support PV solar arrays in the future. Uh, the objective here, again, as David mentioned, you're going to receive 1.65 percent in incentives for maintenance. Once achieved, we'll also receive 2 percent of additional reimbursement for the sustainable design. How we measure that is through a process with the LEED uh, scorecard for schools. Uh, there was a sustainability charrette uh, conducted earlier in September. It was led by our, uh, sustainability consultant, Soden uh, Sustainability. And in that, we went through line by line item by line item to identify the targets for uh, achieving the rating of the LEED rating. The baseline rating for MSB incentive points is LEED certified. That requires the project to score at least 40 to 49 points. As you can read at the bottom of the page, right now we're targeting 52 points, which actually would make the project eligible for LEED Silver, exceeding our expected goal. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to talk a little bit about the value engineering that the building committee went through. So at the conclusion of schematic design uh, on part of every project, this is not unique to Whittier Tech, um, we always look at different opportunities to, we'll say, build the mousetrap in a more cost-effective manner. So we brought $17.3 million um, dollars of opportunities. Uh, some of them uh, needed further review, and they just were not ready to uh, render a decision of accepted or not accepted. Uh, and then there was about 7.7 .7 just not recommended. Uh, on that 7.7, .7, you might be wondering why. Um, it's similar to um, if I was to pro if I was to make a Home Depot list and give it to my my wife, she would instantly say no, no, and no. So there were there were certain VE items that the design engineer um, just said no, that that can't happen. So at almost that 7.7, .7, some of those items w would never even make it onto a list because they just weren't accepted. They weren't feasible. Uh, but what was recommended is $8.8 .8 million of uh, VE opportunities that were accepted. So I want to talk a little bit about recent construction escalation. This is um, taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's a producer price index. It's a little bit different than a consumer price index. A consumer price index has many different indices, and it uh, uh, typically has energy and food, which is volatile. So uh, a producer price index is uh, very finite. It's one index. This is based on the K through 12 market uh, in the United States. And what I want to identify is that in the past, it took 11 years for the index to increase by 50 index points. In a period of two years, 2000 and, from 2021 to 2023, it was north of 50 index points. So what occurred in two years in the past typically would take 11 years. This is uh, some additional data, uh, again, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And over a course of 14 years, the average percent change in the index was 3%. And in a matter of two years, from June of 2021 to 22, it increased 16%. And again, the same month, June of 22 to 23, it went up 11, so 27%. The evolution of MSBA reimbursement. So um, for the committee, for the building committee members here, I'm going to provide some data that is different than what I provided to all of you 24 hours ago. And the reason why is that after we had our building committee meeting, we had a regroup meeting with the MSBA in anticipation of the submittal of the schematic design. Uh, so in the next slide, I'm going to explain the reimbursement rate. But over here, I wanted to show that over the course of time, um, the MSBA reimbursement rate versus the net eligible or the net reimbursement rate 
uh, has decreased. And the reason why is construction has had a trajectory that the MSBA could just not keep up with. Okay. So um, after we had a building committee meeting yesterday, again, we had an MSBA meeting, and they provided us the updated reimbursement rate. On the left was the reimbursement rate analysis that I was using. We had a base of 59.16. We had the maintenance where my guess was 1.5. And then we have the green initiatives of 2%. So 62.66. Uh, the current reimbursement rate is going to be 57.74, a reduction of 1.42. And the maintenance increased by 0.15 to 1.65. And the green initiatives, that stays the same. So overall, there was a decrease of reimbursement rate by 1.27%. When I ran the numbers, that equates to about well, around $2.7 million. So yesterday, I was reporting that the anticipated district share was going to be 298.7. It's now going to be 301 and change. So that's the bad news, but I have good news coming, and the good news is going to far outweigh the bad news with the reimbursement. So this is what I presented 24 hours ago to the school <coughs> building committee. As I indicated, So right here, that is the anticipated district share of $298.7 million. On the next slide, with the updated reimbursement rate, the total project budget stays the same. So the project is still $445.9 million, but this reimbursement rate is updated. The, the MSBA grant has gone down slightly, which equates to the uh, district share going up slightly. However, uh, we were told that at the MSBA board meeting on October 25th, um, the MSBA staff will be presenting to the MSBA board for consideration increasing the construction caps on MSBA reimbursement. What's, what's, what everyone needs to know with MSBA reimbursement, just because something is eligible, it doesn't mean it is 100% eligible. Something can be eligible, but the MSBA has a cap. Once you hit that cap, which every project hits its cap, everything beyond is ineligible. So the MSBA will be hopefully increasing the $393 uh, dollars per square foot for building. That's their building cap. And their site work cap is $39. Okay? Um, I won't mention the number, but the numbers, I, I spoke to leadership today um, and, at the MSBA, and if um, the numbers do come through at the October 25th MSBA board meeting, this will equate to not just a few million dollars of a district um, decrease in the share, but tens of millions of dollars. But I won't know that until October 25th. I have a quick question. Sure. That bottom line, the estimated net reimbursement rate was at 28 percent uh we'll round up 29 percent can you explain that so what it is so what happens is and this is it's it's somewhat deceiving someone says well what's the M what's the msba reimbursement rate for Woody tech it's 61.39 percent of eligible costs you have to complete the sentence subject to caps on the or the limitations of their caps so just because something is eligible, it might hit a cap. Construction is eligible. Site work is eligible up to a cap. So it's deceiving. Certain costs are categorically ineligible. Legal services, you spend a dollar on legal services, the dollar is ineligible. It doesn't matter if you spend $100,000 or a dollar, it's categorically ineligible. So what that is, Dick, is it's, it's basically the MSBA share divided by the total project cost. So that's the difference between... I, know it is. I just wanted you to explain it. Okay. Any, any questions on that? Because it, it can be very deceiving. The public can say, oh, we're getting 62% of $445 million. That's not the case. And this is not unique to Woody Tech. This is across the Commonwealth on all MSBA projects. 
In fact, the MSBA and most OPMs will tell their clients, the first thing you should not say is the state is giving us X amount of percent for the project costs. You need to complete the sentence. So highlight, um, this was, these are numbers prior to our conversation with the MSBA to get the updated reimbursement rate. Again, the total project cost $445.9 million. That is not changing. The anticipated grant amount after October 25th hopefully will change, which will affect the anticipated district share. So the anticipated tax impact. So this was done by Hilltop Securities. Um, I understand that they probably represent nine out of the 11 member communities. Um, these numbers are based on these numbers, okay? Uh, now, yeah, it, 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 the reimbursement rate going down by two, 2.7 million, or the reimbursement rate affecting the district share by $2.7 million, I mean, that might affect some of these numbers by 50 cents. However, after the MSBA's board meeting on October 25th, when they hopefully update their caps, these numbers should change drastically. Tens of dollars, 20, 20 of dollars, uh, because it's gonna be tens, tens to 20 of million dollars going down. Regarding the district vote, well, let me just back up. Any questions on, on this before I move forward? These will change, but yeah, I was going to say, can we have a copy? But the, 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 it doesn't matter. Yeah, hopefully after October twenty fifth, these will go down. Regarding the district vote, back on June fourteenth, I was here, and um, the majority of that presentation was to explain the two different vehicles of getting the project passed. Um, so this was what's considered sixteen D. This would go, this is going to each individual city or town and getting approval at town meeting or city council approval. And then if it could not be absorbed into their levy, it would have to go for a ballot override um, or exclusion. Uh, and if it failed in one district or one community, the project fails. So it could pass in 10 and fail in one. So just graphically, I kind of highlighted one. So if, if one fails, the whole project fails. The other option allowed by Mass General Law is considered, or it's titled 16N. This is having one district-wide election vote and um, the school committee, your board, the board, um, they would have to, they take, they, they take the vote to incur the debt it's a two-thirds majority vote. Um, this board actually can uh, select the date. However, Maureen and company met with all of the clerks from the 11 communities, holistically, collectively came up with what is the best date, and it ended up being January 23rd, 2024. So over here, just graphically, it's all of the eligible voters from the 11 districts show up, and it just needs to pass by a majority. And when this was presented to this board back on June 14th, it just seemed this was, um, while it was not voted on, it seemed like it was overwhelmingly supported as the direction to go. So the district-wide vote, um, the Whittier Tech Regional District yourselves anticipated to conduct a district-wide vote on January 23rd, 2024. And Maureen, I believe this board would hopefully take that official vote on December 13th yes. in the evening. Yes. Uh, the results of the district-wide vote will be based on the aggregate total votes cast in all communities and required for the majority for passage. Uh, so the polling places within each community may vary from, you know, traditional locations and, and past voting. And uh, we're uh, encouraging everyone to contact their local election office. I have a quick question. Can you explain who's paying for this to people? The Whittier Tech Regional District pays for this. Thank you. So 
What if the vote fails? I think, Maureen, you were going to take these slides? Sure. So, you know, there's been lots of discussion about our current conditions of this building and, you know, where we, lot, where we will be if the building um, vote fails. Um, and I just need to be clear with everybody, there are two options here. The first option is the, the new school, and the second option is to bring this building up to code. Um, we have been notified by um, the, the city inspector that we have to put a sprinkler system in right away, um, that we are not allowed to do any more renovations until a sprinkler system has been put into this building. Um, we, through, the f through the feasibility and schematic design, we, did a, we looked at our wastewater treatment plant, and boy, do we have some issues. Um, and we cannot run a school if we are not allowed to flush toilets. So um, that would be something that we would have to address also immediately. Um, and then also an access road in, into the building, another access road into the building. Um, so th those are some of the biggest concerns, um, but then that will just spin off to, we have to bring the entire building up to code. Um, and you know, some of the glass that you see um, between our carpentry and the my office all that glass needs to come down because none of that meets at code we have uh, electrical um, boxes in, in the hallways all of that would have to be um, brought up to code so um, we really looked at this to make sure that we were making the right decision because i know a new building is a tough sell right so i wanted to make sure we uncovered every rock to make sure that this was exactly what we needed to do um, and really, when you look at the money and the amount of time and money that it would take for us to do this, um, it was clear that a new building was the best option. Um, one, because it would be the cheapest option, because we are getting a significant amount of, of funds from MSBA. Um, two, time-wise. Um, and three, it wouldn't affect the student's learning, right? But if we were to do a code upgrade, we do not get MSBA reimbursement, reimbursement none. It would take at least 10 years. And I can tell you from renovating a couple of uh, places here in the building, once you get behind the walls, it's a lot bigger project than you think. Um, and, and one of the other, you know, looking at our ADA compliance, you know, we have one elevator that you can't even put a wheelchair in. I mean, a person can walk into it, but you can't put a wheelchair into it. And uh, none of our wheelchairs go up all four floors. So you can go up to three, and then you get to walk down the hallway to get to the fourth floor, to get to the fourth floor um, elevator. Um, so it's it's really difficult if you've been to our auditorium. It, that is not ADA compliant at all. So um, people in wheelchairs have a really difficult time coming to see our shows. So you know I, I don't need to read this to you. It's pretty clear what's happening. Um, you know it, it it truly is. When I said in the video, it's something that keeps us up at night. It keeps us up at night because we don't have a place to bring anyone. This is it. And we cannot let this building fail. So those are our options. So um, one thing know. I could add, Maureen, is that um, it, with a, a vote that fails, the first few items will trigger the code where the entire building and property has to be ADA upgraded. Everyone right. always thinks, oh, we have to upgrade, upgrade the building. Um, no, it has to be in the entire site. So you have to be able to get from you know, one area of the site to the other area of the site in an accessible manner. And it's, uh, it's very costly. If, I have a quick question. Just let me finish one thing. Yeah. We have been very thoughtful about our communities and how this could affect our communities. You know, originally the state said that we could um, increase our enrollment to 1,400 from 1,280. Um, most of our cities and towns, except I think Haverhill, um, and maybe Newburyport, most of our cities and towns, their school age population has decreased significantly. I have two school districts in our region that are really struggling with enrollment. Um, and that, I don't want to hurt any of our cities and towns by doing this project, right? Because we're all partners. The kids in, in Newburyport and the kids in Georgetown, they're my kids too. And we, you know, we're just an option for those kids. So, you know, that's something that I think people really need. We really tried to make sure that we weren't um, going to hurt any of our cities or towns. One other thing you have to talk about, if you're going to renovate, it's three and four foot thick walls. I mean, that's very expensive and time consuming. Right. And, and we all know materials in the 1970s, oh. um, how, how that could go um, for us. But, you know, the bottom line is there are two options. There are not three, there are two. 
there's a new building, there's a code upgrade, there is not an option to do nothing because right now we are limping our way because we put a lot of projects off because we're in the, in the MSBA pipeline. But that being said, those projects need to be done and they need to be done quickly. Um, so, you know, it, I'll get off my high horse, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> Well, Maureen indicated, obviously, um, Woody Tech is in the MSBA pipeline, and, and um, at the community forum last week, Maureen titled that as getting into the MSBA pipeline is like winning the lottery. Um, and it's true. Um, years ago, the MSBA would bring in probably anywhere from 12 to 15 new projects a year into their pipeline. About a year ago, um, I remember it was a December board meeting, um, they uh, commented to, we'll say, the the design and construction industry, uh, all of us that follow MSBA work, that they were tightening their belt and they would probably only be allowing anywhere from six to eight to ten projects in a year from being in the teens. Um, if they happen to have a year of six projects, I can tell you that one of those projects would be a high school project because when a high school project is in the capital pipeline, it affects other projects not getting into the capital. So, um, you know, it, I don't want people to think, oh, well, we'll just wait and get into the capital pipeline again. You're waiting. It could be anywhere from 10 to 12 years before you get back in. Right, and I think I shared a story. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Sure. A short a story in Western Mass. I think it was a middle school or an elementary school. Um, the city chose not to build that building. That same building from 2016 to now is up 150%. We cannot kick these capital projects down the road, they just get more expensive. So next steps, um, as I probably said four times tonight, uh, the MSBA is having a board meeting on the 25th. Um, we will know where they land uh, if they do increase their um, cap limitations. Um, it will take myself um, probably five minutes to update what I need to do. He'll talk has to do what they need to do, and then we will have an updated um, uh, tax impact analysis. Uh, as I said, sometime in November, we will have a project scope and budget conference with the MSBA. At that point, the numbers are finalized. The numbers are not approved, though, until the board, the MSBA board, that is, meets on December 13th. And then, obviously, the um, January 23rd district-wide vote. And the last slide is we have a, a new website that has been launched about a week and a half ago. Um, we were going to put a tax calculator on this website, but based on what I found out yesterday, where the, um, the caps are subject to change on the 25th, we are going to wait to uh, launch that um, Smart. Um, tax calculator. So um, 60 slides, apologies, it took a long time. Any questions? Does the overall cost include the cost of inflation year over year? Same it does. Yes. Yep. That has been calculated in. Is it adjusted based on the recent increases, or is that an it, average it, over? Um, no. It, um, it it has. It it's um, it airs slightly on the conservative side. Okay. Um, so Good. yes, it's included. Okay. I will. Comments? Just one question. Yeah. Sure. Often the, yeah, the polling places open 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. I know that's right. different than what people usually does. Right, so part of this, uh, it's the N16 Mass General Law. Um, the polling, we can pull from four to eight hours only. So um, we chose the longest, obviously, and we tried to find the time that the most amount of people would be able to be eligible to vote. Okay. So, um, and again, we worked with the city clerks when we had a meeting this summer and came up with that time with them. Is there a snow date? No. <gasps> it's going to be a beautiful sunny day in January 23rd. <laughs> About 50. And you know, one of the reasons why we chose January, I know there's been some questions about that. Um, we wanted to get this out as soon as possible so that cities and towns could plan. This is when people are beginning their budget for the next school year or for the next um, fiscal year. And we wanted to 
make sure that we were, you know, keeping that in the back of our minds so that cities and towns weren't hit with something late, that they were what made well aware of it and that um, they would have time to, to build their budget um, based on the decision that happens on January 23rd. Will absentee ballots be allowed in this kind of? Uh, absentee, not early, will be allowed. Well, on behalf of the project team, thank you for having us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Lynch. <laughs> Not done yet. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, tonight, before you, I have personnel action. I have hires of a desktop and network support manager, a cafeteria worker, a director of technology and information systems. I also have the evening uh, school secretary, along with the Spanish and Portuguese translators. I have club advisors that we didn't fill last year that we have filled for uh, this year, the beginning of this year. I have medical tutors for students that are out on medical leave. I have event ticket collectors, and I have game clock officials. I know I've received a phone, few phone calls from all of you. Um, I regret to receive the resignation of our Director of Technology and Information Systems. Um, Kara Cosmos, the business manager, will be providing a variance update today as well as the five-year capital plan. Uh, Ms. Jensen was providing an update on our spring MCAS results. Um, you heard today, you know, we, the school building committee has been very busy. We had a district-wide forum on October 5th. We have set up meetings and open forums with almost all of our cities and towns. And I wanted to show you that, but um, I shut off the computer. But um, we have set up a, a forum and or a city council or selectman meeting in all of your cities and towns. If you can look at the website, I would love for you to be in attendance at those meetings. I think it's important um, that you are at your community meetings. Um, and I will try, Lisa and I will try to reach out to you beforehand to let you know when those are coming up. Um, on Thursday, September 14th, Kara Cosmos and I met with Mayor Go from Amesbury, we wanted to discuss the building project and preliminary tax impact numbers. On Friday, September 15th through Sunday, September 17th, I attended the MAS, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Executive Committee Retreat in Williamstown, which I've never been to, which is beautiful. Um, I'm on the executive board on MASS representing the superintendents from the Merrimack Valley and the North Shore Roundtables. On Monday, September 18th and Thursday, September 28th, I attended the JCJ Design Follow-Up Remote Meetings looking at vocational equipment placement. I really want to thank Amanda Crosby and Paul Moscovich. We have had a lot of meetings. We wanted to make sure that we did this right and made sure that we had the equipment that we needed um, through the design process so that we weren't coming back later and going, Oh yeah, we made a mistake. You know, again, it's taxpayer money. We want to make sure we do this and we do this right. Uh, on Wednesday, September 20th and 27th and October 4th and today, I attended Whittier's weekly executive project meetings. On Friday, September 22nd, I met with Hilltop Security to go over tax impact to our communities. On Tuesday, September 26th, I attended a remote school building meeting. On uh, Tuesday, September 26th, I attended a meeting with, in Ipswich along with Gary James, Kara Cosmas, Tia Gerber, Bob Hardy, along with representatives from JCJ and my field. This was a tri meeting, so it was the school board, the finance board, and the select board. On Monday, October 2nd, I met with Mayor Ferentini from Haywell to uh, go over the status of our upcoming building project. On Wednesday, October 4th, I attended the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce annual meeting along with Kara Cosmas and Chris Leganis. On Thursday, October 5th, I attended our third Building Project Community Forum along with JCJ and Left Field. On Friday, October 6th, I hosted the Area Superintendent Luncheon at Whittier. Um, superintendents from Amesbury, Ipswich, Triton, Pentucket, Newburyport, and Haverhill were all in attendance. On Tuesday, October 10th, I attended a remote school building meeting. So I haven't been doing too much at all. <laughs> um, I would like to... Um, I need a vote to establish a scholarship. Um, according to our policy, Jim Burke Jr. from Burke and Sons Plumbing and Heating would like to establish a $500 scholarship for an HVAC student. I would like to thank Jim Burke and Burke and Sons Plumbing and Heating for this generous scholarship. I respectfully request the committee's acceptance of this scholarship. So moved. Second. I assume Dave is chairing. <laughs> I'll carry 
Aye. 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 Okay. Post. <laughs> Is that unanimous? Yes. Yeah. Um, I also have a uh, request for a field trip for the wrestling. Um, anytime any of our students go out of state, this field trip will be in Salem, New Hampshire um, at Salem High School for a wrestling tournament on December 9th. Move to approve. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rowe. We have the right paperwork. We will have the right paperwork <laughs> Thank before you. they go. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Any questions? Any comments? <laughs> Dick Mayhew. All right. Next, we'd like to ask up Katrina Jensen for an update on the MCAS this past spring. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Superintendent Lynch, and school committee members. Thank you so much. I'm Katrina Jensen, the associate principal, and I'm here to give you some different numbers tonight, numbers of success for our juniors with the MCAS. So just as a reminder, all our students take the MCAS on the iPads that this committee approves every year, which is wonderful. And then um, we have the performance level of exceeds, meets, partially meets, and does not meet for the MCAS. This is Eng English language arts. Um, for this class of 2025, as of right now, 99% of the juniors have passed this portion of the MCAS. I have one student that will retest in November. Um, and 59% of them got in either exceeds or meets. Um, I would like to point out, because I did have a minor freak out today when I was asked, why the class of 22 is not there. It's not because the data was bad. It is because that the class of 22 would have taken the test in the spring of 2020. And that's when we were already out of school. So that's why there is a year gap. Just so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is... Um, our subgroups compared to the state, just so you could see how we compare. And as you can see, in all of these different categories, we are above the state average, and some of them significantly. Um, this is comparing where the students were in eighth grade in their home districts, and then when they took the test again with us in 10th grade, the increases. So as you can see, we have increases in both exceeds and meets and we have decreases in partially meets and not meeting. We switch over to math, and right now we have 97% of the juniors have completed the math requirement. We have 11 students that will retest in November. 41% um, got into exceeds or meets. And again, I compared the um, math versus the state. So except for all students and students with disabilities, we are above the state average for all the other subgroups. And again, I compared eighth and 10th grade. Um, we did have a decrease in the exceeds, but in the meets we increased, and the not meeting we had a significant decrease. Biology, you'll only see two years here because two years ago was the first spring they changed the standards. So. We, they told us not to compare before that because it's not comparable. So I only have two years worth of data, but right now we have 94.5% of the sophomores have passed their science requirement. So I think I have about 16 kids that will take that in February. Um, and this year they're also preparing for English and math, so it's good that I, we only have 16 that still also have to keep up with the science requirement. So that's really good. And 36% of them got into exceeds or meets. Again, how did they compare to the um, state? Um, in economically disadvantaged and high needs, we were above the state average. And where were they in eighth grade to ninth grade? So because they, we give it to them in ninth grade, um, we had a small increase in exceeds, um, increased in meets, and decreased um, in the not meeting. Um, where are we right now? So the class of 24, who are our seniors, I have one student that I just filed an appeal on in the math area. Everybody else has fulfilled this part of the requirement. So I am fingers crossed. I'll get that um, in November sometime. But so far, since, since I've been in this role, since class of 2007, everybody graduates with a high school diploma. So that's amazing. And right now, our juniors sit at 96.6% MCAS complete. Um, for accountability, 
Um, they rank us in achievement and in growth. So unfortunately for achievement, we did decline in the three areas, but our growth in English and math is high and that is where I was talking about from eighth grade to 10th grade. So our students are showing a lot of growth from where they were. And in science, they don't do it because the science, the standards don't line up because biology is the first time they take a course for one topic versus in middle school, they are taking several topics. Um, our graduation rate is 98.3, and this is for the four years, because sometimes it does take kids five years to graduate. Our dropout rate is less than 1%. Um, in chronic absenteeism, we've exceeded the target that the state said, set for us. Our advanced coursework has also exceeded the target. Um, we had 100% take the test, and our accountability percentile is 68, which means we are better than 68% of the high schools in Massachusetts. Any questions? Yes. Doesn't seem like there was much of a dip with COVID considering all the impact of COVID. You so. know what, I, I did kind of want to mention that, but then I was like, ooh, the math doesn't really show that. But yes, I mean, I we've ever since COVID, Maureen has really made a concerted effort to do a lot where we know kids have learning loss. And we definitely do, still do see that on the math because it's so skill-based. Um, but our students, are benefiting from all the things that this committee has put in place. You know, those those learning loss coordinators that now we call student success team leaders um, have really helped to define like where is the loss, avenues for students to get help, um, all the tutoring after school that we do, the vacation camps, they've just been huge for the students to try to catch up on what they naturally lost during um, COVID. And, you know, we will see this for years. I know a lot of people think it's it's done but everybody lost three years so it doesn't matter if they were in first grade they still lost those years it's just gonna take a long time to for us to maybe see them but um, we I think we are doing an amazing job and yeah. and like I say 100% of kids still graduate with a diploma well done. I just had a quick question high needs what is the definition of high needs so high needs is, is a student in any of the subgroups so I listed like um, economically disadvantaged yeah. L student with disability. So a high needs kid is anybody that falls into one of those categories. They put all those kids together. So it's kind of like taking all the subgroups and making them one group together. Okay. So you might have students that are in multiple groups, but you might have just like any L student falls into high needs because they are in a subgroup. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just spoke mm -hmm. about that. Thank yep. Okay. Any other questions? But, I guess I'd just like to make a comment. Um, <coughs> You know, the teachers with, with during COVID, after COVID, have been all in and taking care of our kids and have really worked the extra mile to make sure um, that students <clears throat> loss, that we, we would try to make it up as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the scores aren't exactly what I would like. I would like to see them higher. Um, but I think that we, ha we ha have systems in place. When I walk around the hallways, I see teachers huddled together talking about how they can bring up their scores. You know, those conversations are happening and um, the teachers have worked really, really hard to get us to this point. We knew, we had a feeling going in that this was gonna this, be this group um, a tough year, but um, these are the same students that when they came in, um, couldn't sit in a chair all day long. These are the same students, at executive functioning skills where they just didn't have, they, we worked really hard. Teachers really had to change their curriculum because kids were so far behind. So, uh, you know, well, the results aren't what I like. I, I'm still proud of them because I think our teachers did a really fabulous job. Mr. Early. Prior to COVID, and you hear all these statistics and you read them in the paper, prior to COVID and after COVID, what is the difference? How much have they lost? Like when they were coming in here from the eighth grade into freshman before COVID and then after. So it's tough to say because if you look at the data, like in English, it appears that they haven't really lost a lot. But I think it's some of the things Maureen's talking about. It's not just like the subject area. It's, you know. No, but they're still behind. Yes, they're still behind. They Did you say they're two grades behind? It, it, it depends on the student because I think some students, if they were independent, if the COVID worked for them, I think they're just going along. But for some students, they are significant, significantly behind. I mean, we have some junior students here that are reading like at an elementary school level right? because right. they missed middle school. 
Um, so we're they lost out. They lost out, and that I I, I just want to because you do hear you know like when I did my presentation with the state, you know they're like oh we're we're getting back, but this is everybody lost three years. These are so real numbers. It's it's for it is going to take a long time to catch everybody back up because even the first graders those they lost some real important three years like my, reading my, skills and my concern is the ones skills. that did lose how do they catch up after they graduate out of here that's a good question we're trying to give them the skills that they need in order to yeah. do that um and we just have to hope that they'll continue their own learning um for whatever that is on their own thank you yeah Yes, yes. I'm Ms. Jensen. Hi, Tom. So this this group was the group that got sent home in March of their eighth grade year, and so really every each subsequent group coming in, depending on what each school district is doing in terms of addressing that learning loss, is it how they're addressing it. But I know when they came to Whittier, we were hybrid right away. Mm -hmm. Some schools didn't even get back into their districts until that following spring, but we were hybrid right away, and then the following year, all in. And by the half year, we were all mm -hmm. in. Um, so I think the results show that despite the learning loss that happened and the disruption that affected kids in so many ways, not just in achievement, um, all those efforts helped at least with this, this was really your first group of measurement around that impact. Correct, over yes. Not only being sent home in March of that year, but also how kids were integrated back into school and how important it was that we got kids back into school mm -hmm. as quickly Absolutely. as we could. Absolutely, that's a great point. Okay, thank you so much. I don't want to screw this up. Now we have the vocational technical okay. coordinators, Mr. M and Amanda Crosby. Like that, or an assessment colleague messed me up here. <laughs> There we go. Good evening, Chairman Gary James, Superintendent Maureen Lynch, School Committee. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Paul Muscovich, Vocational Technical Coordinator and Co-op Coordinator, and my co-coordinator, Amanda Crosby. <clears throat> when we were discussing who was going to go first, Amanda said, uh, age before beauty, so I'm going for it. <laughs> um, I'd like to just cover some of the shops that I uh, supervise. <clears throat> uh, advanced Manufacturing Technology, Automotive Collision Repair, Automotive Technology, CAD Drafting, Carpentry, Electrical, Electronics Robotics, Engineering, HVACR, Marine Service Technology, Masonry, a new shop, construction craft laborer, freshman. I will talk more about that. Metal fabrication and welding, plumbing and heating, and cooperative education program. Um, I oversee um, culinary, hospitality, business technology, marketing, cosmetology, design and visual communication, dental assisting, medical assisting, health assisting, early education and care. 
um, community and, vis and visual arts, entrepreneurship, adult education, um, and the CTI programs. I'd like to cover some of the community events or community projects that we're involved in. Um, there are more that are in the works, but we have not started them yet. Um, the Whittier Carpentry Department will be constructing raised garden beds for community action in Haverhill, and they will be installed in the newly completed uh, rail trail. They also, along with CAD drafting, will be designing and complete plans for a handicap ramp and stairs at the Georgetown Water Department. The Whittier Masonry Department is in the beginning phases of collaborating with the Haverhill Department of uh, Public Works to rebuild the entryway of the Rock Village uh, Bridge Museum. And uh, during the summer, this past summer, our CTI uh, program, Carpentry uh, Students Program, built a storage shed on the site of VC Park in Groveland. Um, Whittier has been selected to decorate one of the big dogs in Bradford Commons in Haverhill on October 28th through the 30th, so please go down and take a look at it. Uh, our art teacher will be um, working with students to decorate that. Uh, we will also be participating again in the 2023 Santa Parade in Haverhill and in Merrimack. Cooperative education update. As of today, we have 165 students, which are seniors, out on co-op. Um, it's, it's pretty close to the last few years average of this time of year and how many students are out. Um, we look to uh, increase that number every day. And um, once the juniors are eligible, that will jump up to 350 plus students. We will be adopting a new cooperative education manual, which includes agreements, rules, regulations, important information for parents. Um, Principal Leganis um, suggested that we pull this together and come up with this manual so that although we have um, you know, parents signing off on co-op agreements, uh, there's a lot of different shops involved with different kind of rules and different kind of um, situations that the parents may or may not be aware of. So this is going to be a clear understanding. They will have to sign off on this manual so that they understand all the different aspects of co-op. Whittier has, a new, uh, has been taking in many new co-op partners and adding new ones every week. Um, we get calls all the way from um, southern Maine to see if we could send kids on co-op up there. Um, many in New Hampshire companies and mostly Massachusetts companies. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question on that? Are those lists made available to families as well as to your department, the departments? What list? The list of pe the co-op partners. Yes. Because I know that there, I've had a couple of um, families ask about what what those who those partners are where yep. they can go to so we have um, co-op liaisons for all the different clusters um, those co-op liaisons work hand in hand with the senior or junior teachers uh, for placement um, the senior teachers are really the ones responsible for working with their students to assist in helping them get a job uh, some students might need a little bit more assistance, but we try to, you know, teach the students to be responsible themselves. Um, if there's not a, uh, one of the biggest problems is transportation. So if a student doesn't have a driver's license and there's not a job in their city or town and they can't get a ride from parents, um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to fill. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so again, senior uh, vocational instructors participate in site visits also. So they're going out to these um, uh, potential co-op sites and they're checking it for safety. They're checking it for, you know, what they're really, students are gonna really be doing there and make sure that everything is uh, on board. Um, 
We just signed a new agreement with the Massachusetts Division of Apprenticeship Standards um, with our electrical department. So um, what that is, is um, the state will be issuing them pre-apprentice um, documentation and companies that have, uh, that are union companies that will be working on, um, you know, union wage uh, projects will be able to have our students working on those projects and would be able to actually pay them uh, union wages. Um, over 300 juniors will be uh, doing their OSHA 10 credentials this year. 286 sophomores will be doing a hot work certification in applicable areas. HVACR students will pass OSHA 10 credentials and hot work certifications during their so sophomore year to give um, more time for the EPA 40 uh, CFR Part 82 Subpart F uh, certification. Um, 17 students last year passed that uh, certification, which is a huge undertaking. Um, there's a new one. It's um, it's the A2L flammable refrigerant certification that we're going to be taking on and uh, tackling also with those students. Program updates. The new freshman exploratory construction craft laborer. Uh, we are in the process of uh, applying for Chapter 74 approval. Um, we finalized the intent to apply, and we're working on our Part A uh, part of that. Um, you will find a uh, memo in front of you um, from, from uh, my office um, explaining what we're doing and how we're going to implement this next year. Um, there is over... Uh, well, just under 3,000 positions just in the Merrimack Valley area for construction craft laborers. And um, Essex Tech is involved with um, the Boston local, and that local takes every one of their graduates. We're working with the local right in Lawrence, and uh, they, they have said the same thing. Whatever number of students you graduate, we'll take them. We are continuing implementation of the Freshman Wildcat Speaker Series, and we have four speakers lined up for this year. Um, what that is, is uh, we, we look for alumni that have been successful that want to come back and speak to our students, freshman students. We feel that the freshmen need to see that coming to Whittier Tech and graduating from here, and if you put your whole heart and soul into it, and you work at it, you can become very successful. Um, we had a um, speaker come in, his name was Doug Sperling. He was a um, health assisting student, went off to college later on and got his physical therapy um, license and started his own gym. And now he's a very, very successful uh, gym up in Maine and has branched out uh, with uh, real estate and stuff like that. So the student was an average student here at Whittier Tech, but then saw the, the benefits that health assisting gave him and, and put it towards furthering his education and becoming a real successful uh, young man. Um, we implemented a freshman safety shoe program this year. Um, there's, a, there's a freshman um, dress expectation uh, that freshmen signed and their parents signed it. And one of those pots in the shops that are necessary to have safety shoes, these students um, would need to have work boots, safety shoes to be part of that shop. Um, Brunt uh, Workwear in North Reading, a company that is very new, um, reached out, we reached out to them and they offered to uh, come in and try and fit as many of our freshman students as they could with uh, boots that were either, um, you know, blemishes or returns that were, weren't used or uh, that kind of thing where they, they had all these extra shoes so they brought them in and 68 plus students 
uh, received safety shoes on that day. Um, there are still some that are needing to be filled. One problem that we had, and I didn't, when I was 14 years old, I had like a size 10 and a half, but some of these shoes are like size four. I didn't even know what such thing as a size four, but um, we couldn't fit them because it's, it's a company that makes work boots for construction. So they didn't have those small sizes, but those kids got t-shirts and a goodie bag and stuff. <laughs> And I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. You sure. Um, so Adult Ed currently has 269 electrical and plumbing students enrolled in the theory classes at Whittier. Um, the plumbing tier five class is the largest enrolled with 41 students. It's actually taking place in the auditorium because we don't have a space large enough for them. Um, cosmetology licensure classes will conclude on Thursday, October 18th. Um, they generally spend a full year with us to get their thousand hours. Uh, the next class will begin in January 2024 to give our instructors a little bit of a break. Um, and we currently have a wait list um, for the 2025 program. Um, Adult Ed is offering four new co courses this fall, which are HVAC refrigeration, uh, beekeeping, fall and winter hive management. There are no bees in the building, promise. Mm -hmm. um, basic sewing and three unique cooking classes. Um, I, I think it was electrical. Um, and one of the cooking classes um, sold out. We opened registration at 8 o'clock in the morning, and those classes were sold out before noon that same day. Um, so that was really exciting. And we're looking forward to um, reopening the kitchen for the culinary. We haven't had that since before COVID. Um, repeat courses that we're offering this fall are basic masonry, basic woodworking, and certified nursing assistant. Um, we're also hosting uh, introduction to becoming a public water system operator, um, which prepares students for their grade one treatment and distribution water operator examination. Um, this, the Massachusetts Water Works Association actually reached out to us and said, we are looking for a place that we can offer this course. And we said, absolutely, you can use one of our classrooms. So we'll be holding that there um, here for them. Um, we are also offering um, in, right now in the fall a 300 hour welding career training program uh, through the Northeast Advanced Manufacturing Consortium. It's grant funded and it is for the um, underemployed and uh, underemployed and unemployed. Um, it includes career workshops and job placement assistance upon com completion. Uh, we will be offering CTI training during the summer of 2024 in uh, the areas of advanced manufacturing, auto body, carpentry, construction craft laborers, culinary, electrical. Um, we're actually going to offer two um, cohorts of that because we have the separate shop space and um, it, it fills up really quick. Marine technology, uh, plumbing, and welding. Um, CVT Exploratory Program, if you are um, new and you're not familiar with this, uh, Whittier offers our Senior Exploratory Program for seniors from our sending communities, so the high schools that you guys all represent those communities um, who expressed interest to their guidance um, counselors ab ab about entering the trades upon graduation. It is no cost to the sending high school. Um, we actually have invited the guidance counselors from the sending high schools um, to come to Whittier tomorrow to discuss this program in hopes to increase student participation for this school year. Um, during the 22-23 school year, students from Haverhill and Triton spent their morning at Whittier exploring one vocational program per week for eight weeks. Uh, upon, upon completion of the exploratory programs, all of the students enrolled completed one of the CTI summer training program, which offered 200 hours of no cost training, um, the career counseling and job placement. So all of the students that did the CVTE program went into the CTI program and then found employment upon completion. Um, capital skills, I'm sure you've heard about that, but um, just to give you guys an update, uh, we were awarded $499,461 in skills capital um, for our automotive technology and health assisting. Um, a portion of it was used for automotive technology, which allows us to implement equipment needed for electrical vehicle maintenance. Um, and then the rest of it was used for health assisting. Um, we got a very nice a virtual dissection table that um, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with. Um, but it's, it's really like hands-on learning for that area, but also our science program can use it. Um, it's it's top-of-the-line equipment. And we will continue to seek skills capital funding as it becomes available, knowing that we have a new building coming, hopefully, and we will need new equipment for our vocational areas. That's it. Any questions? Question. Um, the sewing program, that's new? Summer? Sewing. Oh, sewing, yes. Okay. So we don't have sewing machines here in the building. We do not. They, they bring their own sewing machines in. 
So are they parked as close as possible? Because those are heavy. They are, yep. They're parked right in the in the main lot. They come right in the door and they go to the art room. Okay. Yep. I have a question, Ms. Moskovich. You said that um, there's a group in Lawrence that will take all the students when they graduate. That means they'll all have a job. And then, what is that? Correct. Um, so they would be uh, taken in with the, the local and become apprentices. And after, I believe, a three a four-year apprentice, they'll be full apprentice, uh, full uh, laborers, and earning very high wage for. It's outstanding. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're on the list here. Your marketing one. Is it under another name? Technology marketing. Oh, okay. That's how you did. That's you. you. Thank you. You know someone in that job. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's two checks and seventy-four purple. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um. I know we um, get our numbers on enrollment, that sort of thing, but I'm just curious um, around the CTI programs, the summer programming and the adult ed programming, if we can have numbers specific to each of our communities and how many Absolutely. students are participating in those programs as yes. well. <coughs> Absolutely. I don't think people appreciate how many students are coming into this building after dark. Um, for those kinds of programs and through the summer yep. and how much training is happening for the communities. Yes, we can definitely get employment numbers for that. Yep. And one more question. Uh, you said Southern Maine and New Hampshire. Do you have co-op people up there now in Maine? Maybe in New Hampshire? No, not in Maine. But in New Hampshire? Yeah. Good, thanks. Oh, a, a bunch of different companies, in, in industry partners. That's correct people. Correct paperwork, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christine Morrison, who's the Director of Pupil Personnel Services. Good evening, Chairman James, members of the committee, and Superintendent Lynch. Before you in the packet that you have received are our uh, school census October 1 report. I've also included a comparison from last year for your information. As of October 1st, we have 1,281 students, and that is four more than we did last year. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Yes. I just have a question. The second slide is that IDEA students. Is that what that second yes, slide Yes, the represents? students with disabilities. Thank you. That's correct. Yes. Yes, yes. Mr. Earley. I do have a question, and this is controversial. If switch in Raleigh, hmm. you know, they're, they're negative. Is there a patent why they're negative as well as Haverhill? So Raleigh um, went down by two yep. and Ipswich by three. Is there students. a reason they're not sending kids? Or? Well, it could also have to do with the demographics within their town. So, thank you. You're welcome. My sister, it's one of the. I would suspect Ipswich is one of the towns that's losing kids. Mm -hmm. I don't think the numbers are growing. That's right. I think they're losing. That's right. And I would suspect Raleigh might be the same. It is. They're losing a lot of population. Their school aged children have decreased, yes. Any other questions? And just okay. one. Um, I noticed that, I mean, the um, special ed population has gone down. It has. In just a really short period of time, like over just two years. And I know that in that period of time, the Department of Ed also had a strong role in revising our admission policy supposedly to help you know accessibility and I really I question I wonder and I, I know you can't answer this right now but I'm just wonder if the other vocational schools are also seeing what kind of impact they're seeing the changes in the admission policy that the Department of Ed pushed supposedly to help accessibility that I I mean, question whether that really happened right. and whether other schools are seeing that same kind of impact because I know historically we mm -hmm. were always in the 20-ish mm -hmm. percentage. Right, and it has gone down. So I will be having uh, a meeting with our, my colleagues within the um, other vocational <coughs> schools later this month with uh, FACE 
and will ask that question. Um, but I do know that we did a lot of work around accessibility and how to restructure our, our um, admissions policy and the, how we score it. And we worked around accessibility in the interview process and as well. So mm -hmm. I, you know, we had done everything the state has asked us to do. And I think, um, you know, it is a blind admissions process. So I'm not sure, you know, if they're experiencing that same decline as well. Yeah. But or, that's a great question. Or is it around? how schools are ex exposing students to the program because I know historically we've had difficulties sometimes from one community to the other around allowing students access and whether a student has a legacy or generations of exposure to Whittier Road Tech so they know about it or they just move into the community a week ago they need to know that this is one of their member schools and in their community. It's not a separate, it's a choice, but it is a member district school for their community. So absolutely. Um, I just want to make sure that if we are hearing things like, oh, historically I know this, we'll only let people go who are interested in the school. Everybody needs to know about the school. Right, and, and students don't know they're not interested in right. in something that they've never seen before. Yes, yeah. so especially with transient populations that are coming and going into the communities. If they're not aware of it. If they've just moved into Newburyport, how are they going to know that Whittier Tech is one of their districts unless they're exposed to it through the and, school district? And what we've done over the years, and including this year, is we work individually with each of those districts that might you know, hesitate sending everybody over and we work with them to try to help them understand that this is an opportunity for all of their students that they, you know, that they should be taking advantage of it and at least exposing their students to that. So it does happen every, every year that we work with them. And we yes. appreciate that the populations are declining, but regardless, the taxpayers are paying for all of the member schools, Fair including what do you mean? Christina, are, <laughs> are we still doing the introduction, the seventh grade introduction programs too? Yes, we offer that every year to every district, every middle school. Uh, Jill Karakowitz, our admissions person, she does go out to the schools to make that presentation. Um, and again, it is she goes to every school if they'll allow her to come in and do that. questions are there towns not allowing them her to come in um, so she we working individually with some of the towns that have asked us not to come this year but we are um, working with our partners at those middle schools and also with Desi to make sure that students uh, provided that opportunity so yes <coughs> yes mr. the kids they got denied wouldn't they be uh, reapplied for January so our ninth graders who are eligible to reapply for this next admissions process, their applications can be submitted anytime after November 1st for the mid-year. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. I was just say it might be good for everybody to just check their town website and see if Whittier is listed as one of the sending schools. I did and my information wasn't there. Like all the school committee members were listed but my name wasn't there. It's like, I don't know, maybe, I think it was pre-COVID. Um, so I checked and I put my name and um, my email for for school uh, So people idea. might want to just check their town website and see what's on there. What are your citizens who are coming into the town seeing? Okay. That's a great idea. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Parsons. you. <clears throat> Mr. Leganis. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh boy! Uh, long weekend, long weekend, long day, long everything. It's all good. Oh, I, heard you, I heard you Monday night. Yeah, you didn't call Sunday. That's right. No, I gave you the Monday night message. Wake up. Um, <laughs> good, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Superintendent Lynch, and rest of the school committee members. Welcome, Patty, Donna, to the team. Um, I just have a few highlights here. Uh, we had meet the academic teacher night uh, last Thursday, and it was received very positively by parents. Uh, on that night, parents and guardians uh, were able to follow their students' daily schedule. Teachers planned 10-minute presentations, so uh, once again a success. You heard 
uh, Mr. Gustav talk about the Spirit Week next week, so we're gearing up to Spirit Week and the pep rally. Also, our homecoming dance is going to be Friday night. Any um, anybody want to be a it's chaperone? Uh, it's next Friday, um, and we had 800 students last year, uh, so and we need chaperones. So you guys are welcome. Um, <laughs> anyway. The, uh, the guidance department is also working on uh, college admission, admissions uh, representatives throughout the school year. Our college fair uh, will be held uh, next week, the 19th of the gymnasium. PSATs will be administered here at Whittier Tech uh, on October 24th and 25th. We have about 156 students, half and half sophomores, is that correct? Uh, sophomores and juniors split kind of down the middle. Also, uh, Whittier continues its commitment to safety. Today we had a very successful ALICE drill. Uh, we practiced our shelter in place. Uh, we also had a lockdown, and also we had a uh, scenario of a violent intruder where we uh, exited the building. So we will continue to do that throughout. And additionally, uh, with our cessation program, if you remember our BREATHE program, our uh, three amazing adjustment counselors uh, we are ready to introduce another program. Uh, it's called I Decide. I Decide is a uh, drug education curriculum geared towards intervention, diversion, and empowerment. Uh, the I, De I Decide was designed by MGH, Department of Public Health, and the Institute of Health and Recovery. So anything for our students and knock on wood, uh, you know, with the vaping and, and the dab pen and with the marijuana, we've been okay and I, hopefully I don't jinx myself but we have these programs into place for, for our kids. Also, uh, you heard from Superintendent Lynch that this Friday uh, we'll see you hopefully at the Hall of Fame dinner in the 50th uh, anniversary of the school. And pencil in your open house uh, is November 5th from 1 to 4. That's all I have for you. Any questions? <laughs> there you go. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lacanis. <laughs> Ms. Cousins. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Superintendent, members of the committee. Well, it's October, and besides being um, Halloween month, we also have the variance report for the first quarter of the year and the five-year capital plan. The first thing I'll go over is the five-year capital plan. For our new school committee members, we do this every year at this time. It's just used, it serves as a planning tool um, to update the district's equipment. Um, so this year I did it a little bit differently because we, we have applied for several significant grants. And I have little tag uh, letters next to them. D means district, um, AG means anonymous grant, and uh, MSG means mass skills grant. And um, if you recall, last year in FY23, we received a $365,000 anonymous grant for capital equipment. Well, they have encouraged us to apply again this year. And so in this listing are the things that we have requested. And I did notice a little bit of math problem on the back. It's actually 445,740 um, is the actual anonymous equipment grant request. My formula when I did Excel was wrong. And um, so that's in there. I thought since we had already done these grants, it would be useful to give them to you as part of the capital plan. We also have submitted, or I should say Ms. Crosby has submitted, for a Mass Skills Capital Grant in the amount of $499,846, and that is to replace equipment and materials in our culinary department. And there's a lot of stuff in that grant request, so that is the last page of this report. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank Amanda and Paul for all their work doing the, the um, required information for these grants because we had tight timelines, particularly for the anonymous grant, and they really worked hard and pulled it together, so thank you. One very important thing, though, that I need to remind everybody about is that there are no building capital needs on this five-year capital plan. The reason for that is because we are in the pro project with MSBA with hopefully a new building. However, <laughs> in the event that the vote in January is not successful, the superintendent and I will be providing you with a multi-year capital building improvement plan at the February 2024 school committee meeting. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that. We can't, as she said earlier, we can't do nothing. So you will start to see the projects over the next two, three, four, ten years 
and the associated costs with them. So um, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that there's nothing building related in this capital plan. It's mostly equipment. And before I finish this section, I have to say that you're not seeing a lot of district equipment requested. And that is because, as they said earlier, we have been extremely fortunate in getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants for our equipment. So um, that is the five-year capital plan if anybody has questions. Fiscal year 29, that, mm -hmm. that's basically the year mm -hmm. we're going to move in right before that. Mm -hmm. Can we get some of these 29s in the new school? I would imagine that some of these will be part of the equipment requests in the new school. You know, when we get to that point, we'll yep. be determining what we're going to keep. A lot of it we'll keep because a lot of it is new. Is new. And what we'll replace. I noticed the buses weren't on here. Anyway. Because um, you know that we bought the 17 buses, and so I'm going to have, I'm, what I'm, I'm going to try to do is 17 was a lot to replace, particularly in this economy where we can't get them and they're very costly. So we're going to try to look at a five five buses every year for a five year lease. So that we're kind of constantly um, rotating the buses every year. We do a new lease for five. five. Six years, the ones we right buy now on. Right. So I don't know what that's going to cost. That's Thank why it says TBD, but yeah. that is on the plan for us to Thanks. to look at this year, and I'll keep you updated. I've been on that bus thing. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me a bus question. So no one has any questions? OK. Uh, the second thing is, um, again, for our new members, is the variance analysis four times a year. I do a report where I look at what lines are over, what lines are under. The over lines are in yellow. The um, under art lines are in green. I like green. <laughs> <laughs> we all like green. And at the end of the, of the report, you'll see that the greens are higher than the yellow. Um, this year, the, you'll see some functional transfers. We have the authority within our policy for me to do functional transfers within major functional lines. And what the ones that you see at the end of the report are basically due to the fact that the FY24 budget was prepared last January. And so now we have different staffing. People come, they go, sometimes they shift into a different department. Um, <clears throat> so that's what those transfers are for. A lot of them get credits over the summer, and we have an account for that. So this is to just balance most of those salary accounts. So um, does anybody have any questions on this? We're right on track with where we should be. And that is what I have. Thank you. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> now, the November's annual adjust, um, agenda item review curriculum. Do we need one? Okay. Okay, collective bargaining contracts and review of update of technology plan. Can I, can I ask That's that? That's for can I ask that the review of the update technology plan be put back a couple of months while we get a new person on board? I think that's <laughs> sure. <laughs> he needs to know where the equipment is for us before. <laughs> All in favor? I'll uh, postpone that for a few months. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't think anyone gave the motion, though. Huh? Nobody made the motion. Move the, move the, the superintendent's motion. recommendation. Second. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Oh. Subcommittee report. Do we need an executive join? We do not. Instructional. Okay. Instructional mm -hmm. needs a date, but I think it should be meeting. Yeah. Probably before November. Okay. So three o'clock November first. Does that work? Well, who's I on instructional? I can't make it three o'clock. About it. four. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Did I hear my name thrown around for that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well continue. <laughs> so Four o'clock on the first. Okay. <coughs> in, in your meeting room. Plant operations, Mr. Murphy. We met last month, uh, so I think we're all set for a while. Yes. 
and salary negotiations, Mr. Early. I don't think we have to do anything right now after the first year, maybe. Yeah, I do think um, we, we have to look at contracts, and um, we also I would also like to discuss um, we're, we're have still having a difficult time finding bus drivers. Can so. I speak about that right now? <laughs> you know, I saw you sign a couple places just yesterday or today. I believe we should be bringing that up a little. I know everybody has the same problem, mm -hmm. but I think we should bring it up a little. So I met with our, our director of transportation. She and Kara are coming up with a plan. Okay. Um, so if, hopefully I'll have a plan ready for you in November. Yeah. And we right. can set up a meeting after no that. No problem. But we're, we're working on Don't something. Any questions? Yep. Thanks. And then policy, Mr. Irving. Mr. Chair, we met this evening, went over 33 policies. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. uh, they, most of them are just being cleaned up from MESC's uh, recommendations. In some cases, we've adopted their recommendation. In other cases, we've used our own. But uh, that'll be coming in your packet in November for a first reading. So if you could kind of check those out when you have nothing else to do, uh, <laughs> it would be helpful. Uh, also, I don't know, Kara, on those other two, do we want a first and final reading on that? A superintendent yes on the debt yes did so you, did we're, you? we're forwarding it to an attorney we'll bring it back right. again to okay the next so meeting. hopefully if we have the information yeah all right and uh, so the minutes from tonight's meeting will be in your packet and then we'll have that first reading vote and that's it okay. I've heard from the attorneys they expect to have it back at the beginning of the meeting. so what is again my the attorneys get expect to have it back to me at the beginning of the meeting. okay so we should be able to get that out, perhaps, to the, uh, yes. the members. All right. Thank you, Carr. And that's it. Okay. And finally, just remember that next next November's meeting is Monday at six thirty. November sixth at six thirty. Mm -hmm. And that that is a change. Six o'clock or six thirty. Six thirty. Right. And to remind everybody, that's for the MASS MASC meeting right. that right. is down the case. And Mr. Chair, on the new business, if I might quickly, I know it's been a long agenda this evening, but uh, there are eight resolutions being presented at the Cape, and I thought I'd just mention them. If anybody has a uh, hot burn over them, you can come and see me or talk to uh, Joanna. Uh, the first three, I've, che I've checked with uh, Cara, and the first three don't really affect us by uh, regional transportation. Most of the communities way out in the western part of the state are affected by it, but it doesn't affect us. The other is full funding of METCO which is a city of Boston, regional, Marblehead, uh, Framingham type of thing, so it doesn't affect us. Uh, they would like to pass a recommendation that all districts uh, provide for a coordinator for diversity, equity, and inclusion, so that's going to be on the agenda. Uh, Mass Building Authority, they want to remove the 800 million cap. That might be something that we'll be interested in. Um, school bus stop um, surveillance what's going on is a lot of cars are just flying by you know when the, the, the light goes out you're supposed to stop well people are going by it so what they want to do is put uh, cameras on buses to find the violators and then uh, shoot find them or, it's a state law anyway but it'd just be enhancing that um, Framingham has asked that we uh, reevaluate MCAST and create a new uh, all-purpose test but not requirement of passage for high school seniors and the last one could be controversial but it's really harmless it's a safe store safe storage of firearms they like all superintendents in their districts to send out a letter reminding folks uh, that teenagers and young people are nosy and might go through the closet so the firearms need to be locked up in a safe manner under state law so just a letter going out to uh, parents and students so that's it it's been a long night so I move to adjourn at this point. Second. <laughs> we have a second? All in second. favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.